Oh, good morning, Cornerstone, and um, wherever you are. Uh, God bless you this morning, and thanks for being with us. It's the the end of January in 2022. So those of us who are getting older um, may have questioned if we'd ever see this day. I can, in fact, I can remember as a as a um, young child young child working out how old I was going to be in the year 2000 and um, uh, we're well past that now so uh, look the last couple of weeks we've sort of talked about discipleship and I want to continue with that this morning and one of the issues that was raised last week or one of the the subjects that came up out of last week's um, message was the Apostles Doctrine. So I want to talk about that a little bit this morning and uh, just touch on that and hopefully that will stir some conversation um, or stir some thoughts for you. So why don't we open with a word of prayer this morning and let's ask the Lord just to bless the, the meetings wherever we are. So now Father, we thank you this morning and we praise you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for the beauty of your creation. We thank you the, uh, for your existence that you, Lord, are. And in confirming to Moses, that is what you said to him, that I am that I am. And we praise you for this and we praise you for the statements of deity throughout the New Testament in which Jesus affirmed his divinity. We praise you for this. We praise you for the Lordship of Messiah. We praise you for the uh, indwelling of the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives upon profession of faith in you. And we ask you, Lord, this morning that uh, that, that living indwelling in our lives would be made real and manifest real in our hearts and in our lives every day. We praise you in the name of our Messiah, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, by whom we have been granted access to you. We love you and we thank you for giving us a way out of the hopelessness of our sin and rightful judgment. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, Acts 2, uh, and we'll, we'll read the passage that we used as a, um, as a key text last week, beginning at verse 37 this week. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking breads in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Just repeating verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' Doctrine, I think the King James says, and these continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine. And we'll talk about that word devoted uh, in a moment, because steadfastly is not really uh, the most accurate translation of it. It's a, it's a great desire to see that word in there. 
And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, or the apostles' doctrine, and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So the apostles' doctrine. Now, we, we could take a chance to talk about um, the other issues, and maybe we'll do that over the next couple of weeks. Fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. But the apostles' doctrine, or the apostles' teaching, what is it? And one aspect of answering that question is understanding who the apostles were and um, understanding what doctrine is or teaching. So one who is sent is an apostle. But you notice that the, the scripture is really clear in verse two, uh, 42. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. To the apostles' teaching. Now, I'm not sure um, on the Greek construction, but the presence of the um, uh, the word "the" in there, the the um, article "the" is either attached to apostles or teaching or combined together apostles teaching. So, and, and I would say that that's what it's attached to, the apostles' teaching as a phrase. And so what, what this means is that there was a collection of teachings delivered by the apostles, and they were devoting themselves to that teaching. So these are teachings of the ones who were sent. That's literally the way that we can translate that. They devoted themselves to the teachings of the ones who were sent. And the apostles are the men chosen and commissioned by Jesus to deliver his message. So this is an important statement. It's only a, a very short statement in the New Testament, but it's an important statement because these are the people that, that our Lord sent. He sent them to uh, first reach the, the unbelievers with the message of the gospel. And that's an important thing because we read about this first church of Christ, you know, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. And this, um, you know, this, this kind of behavior uh, should, should also be the behavior of Christians today, that this is what we're supposed to do, continue in these teachings Fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. To continue in these things. Now, the the word that is um, translated continued steadfastly, uh, translated in the ESV as devoted, um, it comes, you know, and 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 in the English we get this idea of persevering in something, and that's that's correct, but. The Greek word is actually to be identified with, um, that we that we actually embrace that teaching and it becomes part of who we are. So that's far more than just a um, uh, a ticker box kind of approach. You know, the the apostles said, "Gather together regularly," and so they tick that box by gathering together regularly. It was this embracing, this living of it, and that they, that they um, uh, took that teaching on and it became part of the makeup of who they were. And Kenneth Woost uh, picks up on this a little bit. I, I think it's probably, I'm, I'm not, never sure how to pronounce Kenneth Woost's name, W-U-E-S-T. And his studies in the Greek New Testament are second to none. They're phenomenal studies in the Greek New Testament. And then as a result of that, he did the expanded uh, translation of the New Testament. And it's, it's a terrific work. Now, I don't know why it's not more highly rated and why more people don't give attention to it. It's, it is a fantastic volume. And so if you want to get yourself a good little volume, the Kenneth Woost, the Kenneth Woost Collection, his studies in the Greek New Testament, as well as the expanded New Testament, would be well worth your money. 
he says of this verse, and they were given, this is how he translates verse 42, and they were giving constant attention to the teaching of the apostles and to that which they held in common with them and to the breaking of bread and to the gatherings where prayers to God were offered. The idea that they, I, you know, the idea is that they identified these teachings as something that they came to possess and to hold onto. So simply the apostles doctrine then is that which the apostles taught. That's, that's what it is. But why is that important? Why is it important that, uh, that Luke, Dr. Luke, who, who made this meticulous historical record in the book of Acts, why is it important that he says these continued steadfastly or these um, uh, devoted themselves continually, uh, gave constant attention to the apostles' doctrine? Why is that important? And why isn't it that he says of the New Testament, these uh, continued steadfastly, gave constant attention to the teachings of the Messiah? Because isn't it the teachings of Jesus that are more important than the apostles' teachings? But the apostles' doctrine is what Jesus taught the apostles. And that's the important thing. So the apostles' doctrine is what the, and it's also what the apostles taught by the authority of Christ through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it's recorded for us in the New Testament. So, uh, you know, Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, I believe the Greek construction of that text means that the things which you are, which you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, firstly. So the principle there or what it's teaching is the things that you um, speak and say and do on earth will have come down from heaven. They have the authority of heaven about them. And to the 12, he said in Matthew 18, verse 18, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So this is not about the earthlings controlling the destiny of heaven. It is about the authority of heaven being invested in these earthlings who would speak the word of God and they would uh, release the word of God to those around them uh, and that they would do this by the authority of God. I just, just realized my phone is not turned down, so I'll just turn that down. Excuse me. So these are... You know, this is what God revealed to them. These, these doctrines are not something they invented themselves. These are teachings and practices revealed to them by God for, you know, for sharing with the lost and with other believers. The foundation of these teachings is in heaven. And the apostles, you know, they, they brought about changes. They established things on the earth that were changes and they did this by divine inspiration there were things they they bound on earth they did this by divine inspiration you know for example they brought uh, teachings concerning old covenant laws such as circumcision as as one example um, they they taught the church the gentile believers were not required to um, to be circumcised to be identified as a believer, as a, um, a spiritual child of Israel, and you know, and and as ambassadors of Christ, they were led by God's Spirit. So remember when Jesus sent the seventy-two out, he said to them, "He who hears you, hears me." He who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So, I'm sending you. He who hears you 
hears me. He who doesn't hear you does not hear me. He who does not hear me does not hear the Father. This is the succession of power that was given to the apostles. And this is the deception of the red letter Christians, the ones who say, we're, oh no, we're following the words of Jesus. And it's always um, such a reverential thing to say, isn't it? That, that kind of thing, that we're following the words of Jesus. Um, it sounds very holy. And I think there's an in intention within that statement to say, listen, the authority of your church position means nothing. Uh, I don't care about the apostles. I'm following the instruction of the one. And that's, that's where I am sitting. Now, I'm not going to get distracted down that direction. <clears throat> but uh, the red letter Christians are in denial of scripture. And, um, you know, from the earliest stages in, in the Gospels, Jesus began to establish the authority of the 12. Um, and to say that, you know, we do not have to obey the teachings of the apostles is a terrible deception. Because, you know, I mean, the very first record, the very first record after the ascension of Christ about the converts on the day of Pentecost is that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So they continued in what the apostles were teaching. That's the very first record of those who placed faith in the Messiah after his ascension and through the preaching of the Apostle Peter. And so if that was good enough for the earliest church, then it's good enough for us. But in the Gospels, it says that we must listen to the Apostles, that, that Jesus sent them forth. He sent forth the 72, so the Apostles and some other followers. He sent them forth with authority and he said, if people don't listen to you, they're rejecting me. And if they're rejecting me, they're rejecting the one who sent me. And, you know, that's a powerful, powerful statement that Christ made. And, um, you know, there were portions of the doctrines of Christ that were made known during his earthly ministry because his earthly ministry was not just about um, teaching and proclaiming. His earthly ministry was also about living the, the requirements of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah so that those who lived in Jerusalem... Uh, those who followed the uh, teachings of Moses and, and the Old Testament uh, canon of Scripture could see in Jesus that he was indeed the Messiah. And then they would understand of a surety. And that's why the condemnation upon the, uh, the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees is so powerful because they could know by the Old Testament teachings that Jesus the Messiah was indeed who he claimed to be. And after the ascension, he revealed many additional teachings to the apostles through direct revelation. And, um, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. So in John 16, 12 and 13, shortly before the death of Christ, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. So there's a, a chain of authority in the, in the Godhead and the spirit of God has a function to perform and that is to hear the things of truth and relay those things of truth to the early church, the early church recorded those things of truth for us. John 14, verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So the Holy Spirit was involved in 
in revealing truth to the apostles and reminding them of the things that Jesus had taught them as well. And he taught them many things. So, uh, and there were things that Jesus had not made known yet during his life on earth. And I, I believe this pertained to things that were, were shown in the Old Testament, but not fully understood because the full revelation about the Messiah was not yet known to the disciples. They, they didn't fully know that, know that prior to the death of Christ. And once he died and was resurrected, the revelation of his uh, messianic authority became fully known to them. And, and I believe it's at this point that the Holy Spirit began to uh, make known to them with great revelation that opening up of the Old Testament itself so that they would see the shadows of things to come were revealed in the person of the Messiah and then uh, they would be able to explain and unlock those teachings. And so when people claim that the words of Jesus in the, in the Gospels are authoritative but the words of the Apostles are not, they are actually rejecting the words of Jesus. And you know, in fact, they would they would simply come across passages like like we've just read in John, um, and uh, in uh, sorry in Matthew and in Luke and in in uh, John, and they would have to say, well, uh, now that I'm a red letter Christian, I am also a follower of the apostles. That's what they would have to conclude. Um, but of course, they want to reject that because. Um, being a red letter Christian allows them certain liberties. And, you know, if you're going to interpret, make such an interpretive statement anyway, you're not going to be held to accountability regarding the scriptures anyway. So the church is, in fact, built on the teachings of the apostles. These form the cornerstone of the Christian church. And, um, uh, you know, that's. That's very important to us. And these teachings were made known to them uh, by, the, by the Lord himself, the, the Lord Yeshua, and by the Holy Spirit who um, unlocked to them these teachings by the authority of God the Father. And these were then sudden, subsequently recorded and made uh, known to us in the teachings of the New Testament. So... You know, together with Christ, the apostles and the prophets form the foundation of the New Testament church. So Christ is that chief cornerstone, but the apostles themselves are woven into the foundation through their teachings and their behavior. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. All right. So there is a building of foundation with Christ as cornerstone. He relayed teachings to the apostles and prophets and the apostles and prophets uh, formulated the foundation of the church, and it's on those teachings that the church itself stands. So in the first century of the Christian church, there were false teachers who were rejected in the church by the authority of the apostles. So Paul warns of this, and he says, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. So you know, this is, this is how Paul was writing to the church. And he was saying, listen, church, we have apostolic authority here given by, by God himself. If somebody thinks that they're spiritual, they'll acknowledge that. They will acknowledge the things we're saying are the things which God has relayed to us. And this includes difficult subjects as well. This includes subjects such as the, the role and authority of women in the church, not having authority in the church. So, you know, when we, um, you know, he talks about doctrinal and legalistic matters and uh, he talks about love for neighbours, he talks about marriage and divorce and remarriage and 
uh, all these kinds of things are spoken of in, in the New Testament. And at one point, Paul says um, that this is what I say. This is not from God. This is what I'm saying to you. This is my wisdom and advice to you here. So we must, I believe, be very diligent to not give credence to people who reject the authority of the apostles. Now, there are other teachings around um, that do not reject the authority of the apostles. So, you know, I'm not saying that we, we cannot look at anything else, but what I'm saying is that those who reject the authority of the apostles are rejecting the authority of Christ over them and therefore the authority of the Father in that succession. In Romans 16, Paul says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offences contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive, deceive the hearts of the simple. So people who deviate from the doctrine of the apostles invariably end up causing division and apostasy. So this is why Paul said, listen, those who aren't yielded um, to the apostles' doctrine, those who are deviating from that doctrine, avoid them. Keep away from them. So that's, a, that's an important statement. And even though they come with smooth words, flattering speech, oh, I just love you so much, all this kind of thing, they are not the servants of Christ. They're serving their own desires. That's why Paul says they serve their own belly, their own base uh, desires here. So we're commanded to avoid those people. So we don't want to embrace those people into the church. At, at best, I would encourage you to, if you, if you have a friend who is such, uh, if they're inclined in that way, work with them outside of the group of the church. Um, work with them outside that realm and try to appeal to them uh, to, to draw them toward the teachings of Christ and to and the apostles and to forsake the false teachings. So you and I are, are saved by grace through faith because of the gospel message. The gospel is the apostles' teaching. It is the gospel that spawns faith in the human heart. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That faith was shed abroad in your heart through the gospel. I'm not trying to read into scriptures. I'm just saying, saying it as it is. And 1 John 1 verse 3 says, That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So let's be careful to honour the Apostles' Doctrine. You know, there are many things they taught about, and some of those things were difficult, some of those things were easy. Let's embrace those things. You know, there is an, important to the apostles, an importance to the Apostles' Doctrine, and God shows them great honour. In fact, in Revelation 21, when it talks about the New Jerusalem, and hallelujah for that, because this place is, is just... It's just a terrible situation that we see the world in. In the New Jerusalem, and the wall of the city, Revelation 21, 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the 12 names 
of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So you think about that. Think about the honour that God gives to those men. Amen. That is, that is honour. Their names are written in the foundation of the wall of the city. That's a phenomenal thought, brothers and sisters. Now, um, I probably don't have time to, uh, to head down this track, but, you know, just as by way of maybe discussion, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> oh, sorry. First Timothy 1, um, in verse 3, it says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any other doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Now, that sounds so broad. Um, that could be anything. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's the aim of this charge. What charge? Not to teach any other doctrine. We're charging you, or we're asking you um, to charge these people not to teach any other doctrine. And the purpose, the intention of that charge is, is, is that love would issue from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, having swerved from these, have wandered into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, which I have been entrusted. So Paul encourages them, you know, listen, charge these people not to teach any other doctrine. There's a purpose in this charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and, uh, and so if they're teaching and embracing of the law, then that is erroneous. The law does, however, have a purpose, and that is to bring conviction of sin um, uh, to the heart and lives of those who are disobedient and bound in sin. Now, First Timothy, so that's First Timothy 1 verse 4. Then you go to First Timothy 4 verse 1. So there's a good mnemonic for you. Uh, 1 Timothy 1 4, 1 Timothy 4 1. Now, the Spirit expressly says in the latter times that some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received in thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth for everything created is by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. This, I, I will use these as examples of things that the, the, the doctrines of the apostles were dealing with. This is cases of legalism opening up deceptive, other deceptive teachings that would deceive the hearts of people. And you will notice the legalism in here, forbidding marriage, requiring abstinence from foods that God created. Um, uh, uh, and so these are major aspects of uh, legalism, that legalism has a lot of focus on food. It has a lot of focus on things such as uh, marriage and that kind of thing. So um, those are a couple of examples about how teaching leads to wrongful um, behavior and manipulation of people, etc., etc. So uh, a couple of things to discuss. 
uh, where does legalism enter into all of this, etc. So uh, God bless you. And uh, wherever you're joining from, we really appreciate you and we love you um, until we see each other again.